Welcome to this week's Monday meeting. Today is October 22nd, 2018. My name's Mark. We're here with a lot of people today, uh, but specifically our guest is Ryan Summers, Creative Director at Digital Kitchen in Chicago. Welcome, Ryan. Thanks for joining us today. No problem, man. I'm super excited. This is awesome. Normally uh, it's just one-on-one. Now it's one-on, what do we got? One on 29. Holy cow. Yeah, 29 today. Yeah, not bad. So to give everyone a quick idea of what these meetings are all about. Uh, it's pretty much a chance for motion designers and animators all around the world to connect with each other and ask questions, share inspiration, or like today, have guests on in here, kind of presentations and interact with uh, artists that uh, you may know of or you may not know of, but it's a great opportunity for all of us people and, and artists around the world to connect. Um, a couple like house, uh, I guess, house cleaning type notifications items. Uh, questions, if you have questions to ask Ryan today uh, in the chat, uh, type questions with kind of like a semicolon and then put your question in. Um, it's, that's essentially like raising your hand, if you will. Um, and we'll monitor the chat. Neam's gonna be monitoring that and calling on people. If, if you have a mic or video and you wanna ask it live, uh, we'll you know, we'll ask you to do that. If not, we can ask it for you. Like if you're at work and you don't have access to a mic. Um, and then let's see. The last thing I have is that we are recording this today. So uh, it will be posted on YouTube and uh, I don't know if we'll post it in like a podcast area or whatnot, but um, the audio will also be made available. So uh, with that being said, Welcome, Ryan. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, really awesome. excited to have you on. And um, yeah, I don't know. Is there a specific topic you want to you want to start with? Uh, we've kind of talked so about. so much. I mean, yeah, there is. I'd love to just follow up from uh, when I was on a podcast back at uh, Half Rose. It felt like we had a never-ending conversation. We didn't even like get started. Really, I mean, we had. How long did we talk before we did the podcast? I think it was like. Oh, jeez. Uh, yeah, um, that was. We decided we should have started recording it, and then we, went, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so. we like talked for like two hours, and then it was like, well, we should probably record this. Uh. Mm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I can talk about anything, but I mean, I, I feel like there's so much big picture stuff, and then individual things um, that'd be great to talk to while we have people here. Like, I I do this thing called office hours every day, where I talk to like one to three people a day during lunch, and inevitably it's either talking about demo reels, and we actually sit down and look at demo reels, like go through I upload them on frame my own. I note out things ahead of time and then we go through and talk about you know, what's working and what to make it better. But um, I'd say that's like half the conversation. The other half is honestly just talking about like where people are in their careers or how they can kind of hit the next level. And inevitably, everybody has the same problems. They're just at different levels. Like you might be a student who's getting ready to graduate and you're trying to find your first job or you've been working for a while and you're trying to figure out if you want to go freelance. Um, a lot of times people ask me like, well, what is it like to be an art director or a creative director? And like, how do you get there? Or should you even want to? You know, because it, it's such a, a mystery in the industry and everybody tells you you should, but it's not always necessarily right for everybody. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, we talk about anything. I mean, I, I think at the beginning when you guys asked me, I put out a tweet saying something like talking about, you know, inspiration, talking about like the differences between stealing stuff and, and being inspired by a certain thing. Um, you know, how to level up any of that kind of stuff would be awesome. Yeah. But whatever questions come through. Well, you know, just thinking about it too, like uh, I would imagine most people on this call today, have a sense of who you are, but maybe just give a quick, you know, origin story and up to where you are now uh, at DK, just for a sure, little bit yeah. of background. Um, I went to school for chemical engineering for like two years, which is really weird to get to here. Um, and then about halfway through going to college, I, I'd always been taking like drawing classes and I didn't really realize you could go to school for animation, at least growing up in Chicago, it seemed like it was even possible, like you had to go out to Cal Arts or Art Center or something. Um, but then I took a computer animation class and switched completely, like halfway through school. Um, I did straight up character animation for the first year and a half when I graduated in Chicago. Um, but then that industry kind of completely fell apart. So I landed a place that did um, video games. They actually did slot machines for casinos, but they were like little miniature video games. 
Um, but it was before like Facebook gaming and mobile gaming. So it was really an interesting time. Um, and, but from there, I learned a ton about 2D animation, learned a ton about game design. Um, and then also, I think what's helped me quite a bit now is I learned a lot about audience psychology, which has been really, really helpful for um, becoming an art director and especially becoming a creative director and working with clients. Um, after that, I went out to LA um, and I landed at Imaginary Forces, worked there for, I think, about four years, freelanced after that at probably 10 or 12 different places, including like Royale, Blur, um, ended up coming out to Chicago to be a creative director here in, at Digital Kitchen. Um, and that's where I'm at now. Um, and then in between all of that, I've been doing a lot of teaching too. Like I teach at, teach at MoGraph Mentor and uh, I'm getting a class put together for um, School of Motion. It's been going slow, but we're putting it together now. So Nice. Yeah, um, let's see. In terms of uh, just, I mean, I start with, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I was, I was going to say, since like you kind of opened it up a little bit early on talking about how with Twitter, you were going to say stuff about career advice and things like that. So while we're on Twitter and careers, I have a question that I lined up with like how nasty Twitter has become yeah. of a community. Do you think people are possibly committing career suicide on Twitter lately just because of like <laughs> how outlandish it's yeah. been and like just like repetitiveness? Yeah, I wouldn't even say it's possible. I would say people are doing it actively. I would say probably somebody just did it a few minutes ago at some point somewhere. Um, I, I'm stunned by the stupidity on, on Twitter. I love Twitter. Um, it's honestly what helped me feel like I was part of the industry. When I went out to NAB the first year, I was totally lost. Um, first year I went like as a motion graphics artist. Um, and I would walk past like the C4D booth and I would just kind of hang around by the edges because I didn't know anyone or anything. I've been doing CG for a long time. I was a 3D Studio Max guy. I've been working in like film on a couple of things, TV on a couple of things, but I didn't know the MoGraph industry at all. And I basically was kind of like almost, I wouldn't say shunned, but kind of scared at that time because everybody seemed like they knew everyone. And I kind of made it my mission that within the next year, I'd meet as many people as I could, you know, outside of the actual physical space. Um, and Twitter became an amazing tool for networking and meeting people. And like I, half the people here, I probably have met. If everybody had their actual Twitter handles, I'd probably know everybody um, or most of the people. Um, but uh, I went back the next year and it was amazing. Like I just, you walk up to people and I think I even put, I looked at my Twitter handle, just wrote it on my NAB tag, or I put like a sticker of my, my icon and immediately it was just like best friend. Um, but I don't know what's happened like in the last six months to a year, especially the last six months, but things have turned shitty really fast in my opinion it, it's become really difficult i know like this time last year um at least politically in the united states you know obviously we have a ton of problems and it's pretty embarrassing and that takes up a lot of the oxygen um but i actually made a, a separate twitter list which is really powerful in twitter you can add people to lists and if you use any of the native twitter apps if you follow a list it takes out all of the ads and all the bullshit and it's just like i'm just following the people i want to follow and it feels like classic twitter like from seven or eight years ago um, so I have a list called MoGraph Monsters, and I just went through and found like the 150, 200 people that I knew that talk motion graphics. And then anytime I saw anyone talking, like during um, kind of stem tide for a while, but I still think even now, especially in the motion graphics community, I don't know what's going on. I have my, my ideas, but I've seen a lot of really awful, really shitty behavior um, across the board where people are just throwing mud at each other or talking shit for, for no real reason. Um, and I've seen people kind of like <laughs> set, set their houses on fire. Um, I think out of just the desire for attention or out of frustration or anger. Um, and that, that definitely goes noticed. <laughs> like in, in the back channels that aren't in public faces and in private Slack channels or um, private messaging or even in just like text messaging, there's definitely people who I would say have probably either been blacklisted or like on the verge of being blacklisted just because their behavior and the way they take pot shots at people and, and get really excited about like the back slaps and high fives they get for it. That we've all done it before. It feels really good for like three seconds. And then if you really realize how there's people that are unhirable just because of their behavior. Um, I, I said all the time, I, I, the average great person to work with gets hired nine times out of 10 more than the amazing asshole. If that makes any sense. Like if there are amazing people that are impossible to work with, even remotely impossible to work with, um, that personally, I know I would, and a lot of other people would rather work with someone who is average, but amazing to, to just hang out with and talk to and is really good at communication. Um, unless I have something I can't get from anyone else and I need it and I can get it in a couple days. Um, and it's kind of funny how people are self-selecting and raising their hands and saying like, Hey, 
I'm the asshole you don't want to hire. Um, it, it's kind of shocking. Yeah, it, it, it's just like in real life. You know, the nicer you are, the easier you are to work with, the better you communicate, the more people are going to want to be around you. Um, it's, it's kind of one on one. But I think the anonymity, I don't know if anybody else feels this, but the anonymity allows people to kind of think that they're bulletproof, except for when you go to get hired, everybody asks everybody, hey, have you ever worked with him before? And, you know, the opinion spread pretty fast. I don't know if that answers the question, but yeah, I, I definitely think so. I think people are, are um, a little, little fast and loose online. Yeah, I think too, like with Twitter at least, it seems like almost like such a big barren playground that like no one's really listening and you can just mm -hmm. like, you know, go off on it. Whereas like Slack or, you know, any of these private channels have a little bit more interactivity with people like hitting you right back or, or whatnot. But um, mm -hmm. From my point of view, it seems like it might be like just kind of throwing your opinion out into the wind. No one's really going to listen to it, but people are taking notice, <laughs> you yeah. know? Yeah. You, you know what? I, I, it's weird that I think I've noticed about Twitter recently, and I think I've only just realized in the last couple of weeks, is that there's a lot of what you're saying. There, there used to be a lot of conversation. Like people would talk, and it's obviously not the easiest place to have a conversation, but someone would say something as a question and then they get an answer and then three people would kind of reply back. Now I feel like it's just hot takes. It's just like somebody's like, Christo did this, fuck Christo. Whether or whatever you feel about Christo, right? Like, and then it's just like pile on and then two or three hours later, somebody who has a different opinion is like, well, fuck that guy, you know, like somewhere. And then it all, like, it just has turned into just mudslinging and kind of hot takes. Um, and I think the greater world at large is turning into that too. So it's not like it's just us. I think we're just kind of reacting to the world. But um, I'm starting to wonder if it's just built into the DNA and the messaging structure of Twitter that sooner or later we would get to this, like sooner or later it would end up just being like this. Um, so yeah. Um, yeah. I see somebody in the, qu in the, in the questions was asking. Um, yeah. If you uh, go to my Twitter profile, it's uh, MoGraph monsters and anybody who is in um, into motion graphics, just hit me up and I can add you to that. And then it's, it's not perfect because people are still kind of, you can't, you can't, mute specific things inside a list but at least gives you a, you know you're looking at people that are just motion graphics um and i have one for all different things and i think anybody could do it it's pretty awesome um but i have one for people who talk about theme parks or people that just talk about drawing or web comics i think it's a great way it's a little secret right now like i have a buddy who works at twitter um the best thing about it is that especially since like tweetbot and everything you've been kneecapped by twitter all the native apps will throw you tons of spam and tons of ads and the ads are awful they're not targeted towards you lists are great because it removes all of that at least for now, who knows? It'll probably change. <laughs> said this, um, but uh, for now, it's a nice, clean, quiet way to just like interact with people. So, yeah, Mark, do you want to ask, kind of like going off Ryan, what he yeah. just said about like working with someone and being easy to work with? Because you have a great question in there. Yeah, there's a lot of talk of you know, like, is technical skill better? Is it better for the person to be easy to work with, and you know, mm -hmm. vice versa? But like. Does that mean if, if a person's easy to work with, okay, they're nice, they're friendly, they don't bring smelly fish in and heat it up in the microwave or something like that, but uh, does that also that's mean that they're, just, <laughs> that they're just, that they're just like a pixel pusher and like a yes person, you know, um, and someone that is very good at following instructions and, and taking direction. Um, like maybe, if you could speak to that, especially, you know, from a, a, a creative director position at DK, you know, yeah. um, I'd be curious to know, you know, the freelancers you bring in, how are they, how are they easy to work with besides just being a nice person? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot to unpack there. I, I would say there's probably two or three things within that. Like the easiest part is just being a good person, right? Like, like we were saying before, like being cool to talk to um, I, I, I want to, he's probably not here, but I would love to, um, love to call out somebody, a guy named Mark Walden. He's easily the, the easiest to hire freelancer I've ever worked with. I won't say he's the best or he's the most creative, even though he probably is. Um, he's technically capable. He is creative, but the thing is he's a joy to, to work with. And some of that is like, he's nice to talk to you and he has some great things to say. But um, if you ever want to know how to get hired, reach out to a guy named Mark Walzak and ask him what he does that makes him stand out from the crowd. Because I've never worked with him in person, but every single time there's a job, I immediately try to hire him. Um, he's remote. He works in Nashville. I'm in Chicago. Um, he communicates better than anyone. He's always five minutes early to a phone call. Um, he's almost always ready to go. He has just the right amount of kind of small talk to check in and 
see how everybody's doing. Um, but he gets the business very quickly. He knows exactly what he's um, required to show at this check-in. Um, he has, this, this is something that's very hard to, to teach people because I don't think people teach it in school, but he almost always fulfills exactly what's asked from a creative director and art director, but he doesn't hold back if he doesn't have an idea, or if he has an idea of his own creatively or technically as well. But he'll always make sure that he fulfills the request or fulfills the deliverable at that time. And then he'll also have, you know, I was thinking about this and this is the reason why, because there's a shot later. I don't know if you've thought about this or not, but can we talk about it? And he'll do whatever he has to to present that idea in the fastest, most efficient way. Um, you know, if we have five shots in an animation he's responsible for, but he thinks that instead of a close up, we should have a far away shot and then do the close up, he'll do a version that includes what he's talking about and can have the conversation. Um, so I, I don't know the best way to say it other than I would give Mark Waldeck a ping and ask him how, what his philosophy is on it. But as someone who is, I've only worked with remotely, um, I would hire him staff immediately um, if I had the option to, even if I can never walk in and shake his hand in the room or go to lunch with him and talk about things because the communication is amazing. Um, the, I talk about this all the time. He's the most easily art directable freelancer I've ever worked with. And that doesn't mean that you're a yes person um, or a yes man or a yes woman. It just means that you understand there's something about like um, you're knowing when to show off your ego. Like, oh man, I came with this awesome idea. I got to show it to you. And then there's other times where you need to understand when to kind of quell that a little bit and say like, oh, this is when we just have to get what was asked of done. And that's something I do as a creative director, right? When I work with a client, a lot of times I don't think freelancers realize that their immediate supervisor or the person giving them um, direction is a client, even if it's not the person paying the bills, right? Because I do it with the client all the time. There's times where I really want to get an idea across. And I'm like, I don't think you understand the problem, um, but it's not the right time. Um, and then there's other times where they need to be pushed. They need to have an idea kind of added to it. Um, he just has a sixth sense about that. Um, and I think it's, I think it's something that's partially just in his personality, but I think it's also something he's taught himself. Um, I think he could put a master class together on, on how to work as a freelancer. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, that's, that's great advice. I, you know, to throw, I don't know if this is a curveball or whatnot at you, but you know, a lot of people who are freelancing say at an agency may mm -hmm. have someone like you as, um, as the CD giving direction and, and whatnot. But I wonder if, like, do you have an opinion or, or any thoughts on someone who works at, say, just a company, right? Uh, a, a tech company, whatever company, uh, and maybe they're the only animator and motion designer there. And mm -hmm. their creative director is giving direction, but can't necessarily speak to animation or motion graphics. Yep. And, like, how, either as a, a freelancer or as a staff uh, mm -hmm. animator, how, I guess, how is the best way to like communicate your idea without, um, to someone who's not as knowledgeable in this space? You know what I mean? Like they might have yeah. a clear vision of this is how it looks in print. And I want that right. to look like that in my animation. But as an animator and as a creative in the field we are, like there's, mm -hmm. there's better ways to do it, I'm sure. You yeah. know, and how do you communicate that in a way that's not going to like rub the uh, CD the wrong way or whatnot? Yeah, I think, I think that that's a, a great question. It's something that actually comes up in office hours quite a bit. I, I talk to a lot of people that are like, I'm the only MoGraph animation designer <laughs> at the company, right? Like I work for uh, a gate company or I work for a company that does social media for a weird industry and I'm the, I'm the person who does all of it. Um, I think that's where we start talking about what, what um, I mentioned a little bit earlier. It's like that's where it's your first opportunity as an animator or designer to put on your art director slash creative director hat because you have to start treating your boss like a client, right? Like you have to educate them. You have to slowly like build them into the way you need them to think to be able to give you the direction you need. So I think if that's a big picture kind of answer. I think it's treating them in a way that, that you respect that their creativity, but you understand that they don't have the tools to have the conversation. So um, when you do an animation, you don't just give them the animation at the, the delivery date. If someone tells like, hey, I need this by Friday, on Tuesday you show them roughs, right? And maybe it's just sketches. And then on Wednesday you show them the sketches put together on a timeline, right? With a little bit of you know, stock music thrown in. But you treat them just like a client where you make your own internal milestones. You're like, I know I need to get approval, but if I wait till the end, it could be a disaster. And you would never do that with a client if you're working directly with them, right? And the creative director may not know that they need that. That, that's the hardest part is that as an animator or designer, 
sometimes you get in those positions where it's like, I'm actually teaching my boss how to be my boss. Um, but if you do it the right way, it, it, in some ways, it's almost like dating. It's a relationship where you're telling them what you need and they're telling you what you need, you know, to give back. And sometimes you have to teach someone that, right? Sometimes you have to explain to someone how, how you need the relationship to work. Um, I don't know if that went a weird di- direction that you're, you're <laughs> with your girlfriend or boss. Um, but I do think there's some of that, right? Like, I, I think there's a lot of frustration in the industry right now because people aren't getting to where they want to go or they're in a position they're like, how can my boss not know what he needs to do or she needs to do for me, right? Um, and I think there needs to be, I think across the board in the industry, um, we have so many deadlines, we have so much stuff happening, um, everything's turned around fast for less and less money. I feel like on our side, there needs to be a little bit more empathy for everyone at all levels in, in the company or at the studio that you're at, right? Like empathy for the studio manager, empathy for the human resources person, understanding that your creative director might be on six jobs at the same time um, and that they only have so much time to talk to you. So tell that art director, or creative director what you need. You know, like you don't have to just be passive and wait back and sit and listen. You can tell people. You can stand up and be like, look, that, is, that critique you gave me isn't enough. You know, like I need to know if I need to do something that moves faster or slower and what reason, like why. Um, you can expect more out of your supervisors than you're getting. Um, and there, if you're not getting it, there's no reason that you couldn't go up to the next level and be like, can we sit down and talk about how I'm receiving critique or feedback? I feel like I'm, I'm lost or, you know, I just need to have a conversation with another person in the room. So mm-hmm. it, it's hard. If part of it I'm saying like take authority, but then the other part I'm saying is like sit back and listen and think about the position that that person might be in. Right. And it's a, it's kind of a slow burn too. It's something that's not going to mm-hmm. necessarily happen overnight. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just had a great conversation with someone last week talking about how they brought in a new artist and they were supposed to be an amazing animator and they're kind of average animator or, or maybe just like starting to learn how to animate and their relationship, this person realized like they were supposed to be peers, but now their relationship is I'm kind of a, a mentor to someone who is essentially an apprentice. And I, my advice is like treat it that way, but also tell your supervisor, whoever is running the, the show that, you know, this is now changed. I want to make the best of it. But in three months, I'm going to do these four things and I need you to kind of come in every month and see if it's moving along. Um, it's just openness, honesty, and like I said, a little empathy, but then also giving people like expectations that they need to perform too. Right. So like while we're on that, can you talk about your project process a little bit at DK since we're kind of talking about Mm. that right now? Yeah, no, I wish, I wish I could show you guys the, I just did two really big pitches here that we ended up winning, but they were both like three month long processes for pitching. Um, so inevitably, we, we do a lot of animation, a lot of motion graphics, but a lot of it now is, is kind of couched in physical spaces. So like last year we did Mercedes-Benz Stadium in Atlanta, um, and we did the opening animations for like the Falcons and the Atlanta United, the soccer team. Um, and that was probably six months worth of pitching, winning the pitch, and then designing. But normally what happens is I will go to, I'll get a call from a client or my biz dev person or my, my account person will tell us like, hey, uh, the Atlanta Falcons are interested in having us you know, make stuff for their 21,000, or 21, yeah, it's hard to even say out loud, 21,000 pixel wide screen that's at the top of their, their stadium. Um, so we'll go out, we'll probably meet with a client, um, we'll take a lot of notes, ask a lot of questions. We do these things called workshops, where we'll basically interview the client for like an hour or two, um, and it's pretty awesome, um, and it's a little nerve wracking. Then we come back, we record it, like we record audio, sometimes we record video of like the whole room, of the two or three of us and a bunch of people in the, in the room, five or six other people. We come back and then we'll sit down with myself as a creative director. Sometimes I'll have a writer. Um, sometimes I'll have a, like a junior artist. Um, and then a, typically we'll have an account person um, or we'll have, um, or we'll have uh, a producer with us. Um, and we'll spend, depending on the size of the project, between two to six weeks kind of coming up with initial designs. Um, and then we pitch the client. So again, going back to the client, either doing something like this, which is awesome. Increasingly, we're doing this more and more, just literally on Zoom. Or we'll fly out like we flew back to Atlanta and do like an in-person pitch. And in that sense, it's a lot like pitching a film. You know, like you're basically going to people who have a lot of money, you have an idea, and they have to decide if they want to spend the money on your idea. Um, and then like something like Mercedes-Benz, once we want it, um, we probably, I think we're on like a 12 or 14 month schedule. Um, and I'd say the first three or four months is designing, building the team, um, getting the freelancers earmarked that we want to work with. Um, and then probably the next three months is like literally building all the assets. You know, like if we're building, you know, we had to re- rebuild the city of Atlanta. Um, they have a giant falcon outside of the stadium that we had to rebuild in 3D. It was really interesting because we were building it while they were building the physical one. 
So we're getting like footage and video from the sculptor back to us and we kept on rebuilding it, rebuilding it over and over. Um, and then probably another two or three months of animation and then finishing. And then we do a lot of testing. So we'll think we're done or we know we're pretty close to being done, but then we'll end up going to wherever it is. We just went out to Mexico City last week. Um, I flew out to Japan. I have a project in Abu Dhabi where we'll fly out, we'll test stuff while the, the actual physical space is being built. And then inevitably we end up remaking half of it because the vendors that are supposed to build the screens never build them to the spec. Um, it's basically trying to take whatever we have and fitting it to whatever ends up in a physical space. Um, yeah, and then we ship it and then hopefully it works and inevitably we get a call that it needs something new. Um, with Atlanta, we get a call every couple of weeks that you know there's a different team playing or if they're going to the playoffs and then uh, we rebuild stuff for them based on who the kind of team is at the point. So, um, I don't know, that's a so big something thing. like that, you don't give them like a package or like a- We do, uh, we do, we do and they have a great, like Mercedes Benz Stadium has a great motion graphics team. Um, but they also are responsible for like a lot of custom bespoke stuff. Like if um, sponsors come in and let's say Coca-Cola wants to pay for the halftime show, they end up making a lot of that work. And then they'll call up so like, hey, can you, we, we have a, a like, it's one of the things that I think is really great about what we do at DK is we have really good um, account services. So essentially like any client that comes in, we build a relationship and then we try to extend that relationship. And that, that ends up getting us a lot more work because we take care of our clients. Even after they've, they've kind of, you know, fulfilled the contract, we make sure that they're, they're taken care of. Nice. Liam, is there any uh, questions popping up in the chat? I saw something about Octane. I was waiting for, for an Octane yeah. or Redshift <laughs> question sooner or later. Yeah. Yeah, I guess this kind of ties in a little bit. It's from Pedro, and he's at work, so he can't ask the question, but he says, oh. I think there's been what's called an octane boom in the industry recently in which thousands of creators gained access to great render power, and yeah. the traditional niche MoGraph skills are now shared more than ever. So what's your your view on that? So now I instead of that. like having someone dedicated to rendering, you're having someone dedicated yeah. to MoGraph and rendering and everything. I love, I love octane boom. It sounds like a Street Fighter special attack. Um, <laughs> awesome. um, I feel like somebody should do, if, there, if, if this stupid Render Wars thing has to keep going, I wish somebody would actually animate it like Street Fighter versus Mortal Kombat and Redshift could be Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter could be Octane or whatever. Um, I, I, yeah, I do, I do think, I, I've said a lot about this. I feel like people are barely pushing the, the technology, really, honestly, at least in MoGraph. I feel like everybody, I feel like we're at the point now where, where style has been codified by technology. Um, where people's styles are like, oh, he has an octane style or someone renders like Redshift, which is just it's ridiculous to me. Like, it, it seems really silly. Um, I feel like they all do so much stuff kind of very similar that, um, I don't know. I, I loved when, it, one of the best things was when I think when EJ started playing with octane and showed people that like, you can do really cute cartoony stuff with octane and you don't have to turn on all the post effects and everything doesn't have to have bloom and everything doesn't have to be volume fog to shit. Like you can still make amazing things. Um, but yeah, I, I'm seeing Pedro kind of respond to it. Um, I, I think what's happening now is what happened to the 3d studio max industry like 10, 12 years ago when I was working and starting to use um, 3d studio max. Uh, originally it was kind of a niche tool. And then all of a sudden a bunch of plugins came in, then V ray showed up and mental ray showed up. Um, and everybody all of a sudden had access to flow reel. Um, I think personally in the next few years, everybody's gonna be able to do anything they want in terms of realism or stylization. And it's, the world's gonna return back to, to artistry and more to creativity. Um, and I think it's anecdotal, but I feel like I've been actually in my office hours been having a surprising number of conversations with people who are really frustrated because they are um, seeing their jobs and their connections go away because they used to be a technology guy or a technology girl. Um, like they were the ones who could do motion graphics when nobody else even knew what it was. And now with, I don't even think it's just the render engines. I think having Cinema 4D in After Effects, um, I think the Creative Cloud making just everything accessible. And obviously like if you guys saw Max at all, like the tools are getting ridiculous that will be coming out in the next couple of years. Um, I think it's going to go back to and what it was before. And you see this in almost every industry that has a technology boom. Um, it's not going to be about technology. It's not going to be about who can, who can make a photorealistic render. It's going to literally be about, and that's why I bang on this so much, it's going to be about your voice or your vision or your ideas. Um, it already is, but I feel like we're just seeing a lot of people like, oh, I didn't know I needed motion graphics, and this guy can do something photoreal. Um, I, I think it's weird because people always ask me, like, oh, are the prices going to go down? Is it going to mean that everyone's going to be fighting for the same things? Is there going to be like a, 
a 99 designs for motion graphics. And I'm like, there, there always will be something that's kind of like low hanging fruit, right? Like I feel like you saw it in the explainer explosion. Like at, for a long time, nobody was doing explainer. So anybody could come up with a, a basic rig in After Effects and could animate all of a sudden, you know, had a company making explainers. Um, but now everybody's animated with a cartoon hand swiping a phone a thousand times and everybody has the same two character design. So people think explainer videos are over and that, you know, it's the lowest hanging fruit. Um, but I do think it's weird when you see a company like Buck or a company like Oddfellows do it as extensively a, a explainer video, but their, their look, their style, their voice, the way they animate, the way they tell stories is so different from the thousands of other people doing them that people will still pay a lot of money for a well-executed explainer video. I mean, I can't say the number, but um, we worked with a very large tech company in our Seattle office and the budget for these explainer videos were six figures. You know, like it, it, and if you looked at it, if you looked at what it could have been, somebody could have made an explainer video that was super low end. Um, but I think the same thing will happen with 3D. Like it'll be commoditized just like VFX to a certain degree. And if you just do what everybody else is doing, you can expect to get paid less and less and expect to do more and more. Um, but if you do something that no one else can do, if you do something that people come to you for you and not for the fact that you have a license and an engine and a, a good set of CPUs or GPUs, um, that I think the industry will still be fine for people. Um, but yeah, I mean, I definitely think that there are, I'm excited that there's so many people doing motion design. There's definitely some people out there that are really upset that guys like Brograph and guys like Grace Gorilla and people like Andrew Kramer or even me are giving away things for free or talking to people about things like day rates or how to bill or how to do kill feed. Um, but those people were never, I think, and I'll probably make some people upset, um, those people were never really in the industry because they enjoyed the industry. They were in the industry because it was easy to get paid for pushing buttons. It's just like, it's the one thing that really frustrates me is that anybody who gets mad at you guys or anybody who gets mad at Chris Doe or anybody who gets mad at people who are training people or Joey or Michael because they're teaching people or they're giving it away for free, they might as well get out of the industry now because that's not going to slow down. Yeah, I think there's somewhat of a backlash on that, right? Like, um, I mean, personally, I've learned a lot through chatting with you. I've learned a lot through, you know, all these other outlets. And yeah, you got to take it with a grain of salt, you know, like when Christo talks about selling a logo for $150,000, like that's just not in my wheelhouse. But yeah, there's mm -hmm. companies out there, agencies out there, that's what they do, right? But um, yeah, I don't yeah, know. And that's I, a good point. I, I, the thing is, that when, when Chris says that, I think it's great because it opens people's eyes that that's possible, right? Like you or me working by ourselves when no one knows us, we're not going to have access to the MailChimp's of the world. They're going to pay two different agencies to rebrand themselves when all they really did was simplify the logo, change the font and codify everything into like four colors for a, a color palette and hire an amazing illustrator. But there are companies out there that will. And the fact that that's possible in the day and age when everybody else is worried that, oh, everything's going to be, we're going to get paid less and less. I think people need to understand that, that that's out there and it's something that you can reach for and understand what it takes to get there. Mm hmm. So I guess like <clears throat> kind of piggybacking off that something that I had jotted down are like what what would you say would be your like top five like career tips or even technical tips for like a uh, for an animator or motion graphics artist while we're like kind of on this topic of giving away yeah. info right. Yeah, um, I would say my, my number one thing that I still think no matter what happens in the industry um, that I think can, can help you and I won't I can't tell you how it will help you or when it will help you but I will tell you that it will is um, level up your ability to draw as, as fast and as much as humanly possible. I think the ability to draw still and will always especially as more people start doing you know more they learn what the computer is actually doing. Um, Drawing in front of a client or drawing in front of a supervisor looks like magic and always will. No matter what you do, someone will say, fuck, I wish I could do that. If you can communicate your idea by drawing it out. Um, and if you're looking for a way to level up, I can tell you I've interviewed like almost 200 people for a senior artist position here. Not a single person could draw. I asked them like, hey, do you draw? Could you send me some pictures from your sketchbook? Can you send me something from your Instagram? No one was drawing. Yeah. Um, I think that's the first one. Um, I think the second one would be almost as close to that. Um, 
is to get a camera, like a real camera, like a real DSLR um, or mirrorless or something that isn't your phone and carry it with you as much as possible and make imagery. Um, take that imagery, take it home, get in Lightroom and decide what your way of shooting looks like. You know, like what it means. Like I, I say all the time, like voice and vision, the fastest way to discover what you like and what you don't like is to try to draw and struggle through it and then go out and take a camera and try to make an image the way you see it, not the way someone else sees it. Um, mm -hmm. So I think those two things can help you. I, just speaking as someone who started off as an animator, was drawing every day and then didn't see that coming out in my work at all. And then was like being asked to make style frames and I'd never taken a photo before in my life and having to go out and find something that wasn't just stills from when I hit, you know, Unsplash or I go to another just kind of free site. Um, that stuff makes a huge difference. Um, I think another thing is to, I think networking obviously is huge, but I think being very like targeted in your networking. So say like, say you want to work at Giant Ant or you want to work at Oddfellows, start building the relationships with the people that you want to sit next to like as soon as possible. You know, like if you want to work at Giant Ant, go and find the three people that have worked on every spot they've done for the last year and reach out to those people, share stuff, ask them questions, um, ask them if they could take a look at your work, ask if you could do this, like a Zoom kind of situation. Um, but like targeted networking, not just like go to every meetup and drink with the same people and complain about the same things. Or you know, like I see people networking and I feel like it's just people trading business cards. It's not people um, building real relationships. Um, I think the fourth one would be get used to public speaking in any way possible. I know that's like scary. And I know as an animator, a lot of people think that that like makes no sense at all. Um, but one of the fastest ways you can kind of level up your profile is to be able to get in front of a bunch of people and do something like this. Um, and that's just out of personal experience. Like I was never a good public speaker. I don't even think I'm great, but I'm comfortable doing it. But I literally every semester for two years took a speech class just to get used to being in front of people and talking to people. Um, so I think being able to do that would be awesome. Um, I don't know, the fifth one, I would say if you do specialize in anything, um, finding a way to learn the step before and the step after of whatever you specialize. So if you are super into character animation, understanding rigging and understanding modeling, you know, or if you love doing environmental, um, if you love world machine, understanding compositing and maybe understanding photography, like the step before and the step after. So that even if you don't do it, um, being able to understand what the person before you and the person after you need in the pipeline. Um, I think that that can help you too. Is that, is that answer? Is that, was that, I think that was fine. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, cool. Liam, is there anything else popping up in the chat? Yeah, there, there was a follow up. Uh, just recommendations that you might have for books or learning resources for people that want to get into drawing? Oh, yeah. Um, there's a ton. Um, the first one I would tell you is go to controlpaint.com. I think they're still around. They have a ton of free tutorials. Um, they have a ton of very focused uh, tutorials as well, but they're great. Um, I think uh, MoGraph Mentor, not to plug them over and over, they have two or three really great um, classes. They have a character design class with all world-class Disney feature animation character designers. Um, Steve Savali has a really great illustration class, um, but it is both very specific on, on, on illustration. Um, if you're really into animation um, and you want to get into more character animation, um, there's obviously like all the, the really big books that everybody tells you to get, you know, like there's the Richard Williams Animation Survival Guide, there's Illusion of Life, which is more like a history book than really like instructional, um, but there's a really great book called, I'm trying to remember the name of it, but it's by the, a guy by the name of Wayne Gilbert, um, it used to literally be sold on his website as like a pamphlet with like a spiral binder. Um, it's maybe only a hundred pages long, but I would say it is the best thing I've ever run into about posing for character animation. Um, and I'll find the name of it, but it, it's something like simplified guide to planning animation for, or drawing for planning animation. It's a really wordy title, um, but it has some of the best kind of explanations on how to pose characters just as boxes and lines, and then how to take that into like the next step and the next step and the next step. Um, yeah, I think somebody got in there. Simplified Drawing for Planet Animation. Thank you. Um, that book is, I think, amazing. The cool thing about it now is I think it also sold as an ebook, so you can have it with you everywhere you go. Um, so I think those are awesome. Um, I think somebody else, else asked about what about learning to filming with DSLR? Would that benefit? Yeah, I, I think anything that helps you with storytelling, um, I think that's probably one of the biggest weaknesses in our industry is that everybody's just focused on design and cool transitions <laughs> like how to do something that looks cool and people i think the biggest problem with our industry right now is people get excited about something difficult not necessarily something well executed so 
what people are always like, oh man, look at that title sequence. That would look like it was so hard to do. And not necessarily it's like, wow, look at that title sequence. It made me think about the TV show that I was about to watch. Um, so I think even in the voting, even when people vote for, you know, the opening titles and who wins which title, I still think people are voting on, I don't know if I could do that. That was super hard versus, oh wow, that title sequence. I want to keep watching it because three episodes in, it told me something I didn't know about the show. Um, and I go back to it and I watch it again. Um, so yeah, I think um, definitely learning to shoot would be great. There's a really great site called creativelive.com um, that they just started doing. That you can normally buy a bunch of tutorials like individually, but I think they just offered for like $300 um, a site-wide year-long um, subscription, kind of like LinkedIn Learning or any of the other ones like uh, Plural Site. Um, but they're very focused on photography. They have a decent amount of videography. Um, they also have a lot of stuff about kind of like building your brand and building your kind of career um, as a like a solo entrepreneur, which I think is probably another thing, especially for this audience where there's a lot of people remote freelancing, a lot of solo people running their own businesses. Um, I think that's something that our industry is definitely going to level up on. We see things like, I think the legal kit that just came out yesterday for um, from uh, the guys at the future and then um, Haley's motion hatch mm -hmm. freelance contract. They have a lot of information, not necessarily legal, but on creative life about how to kind of set up your business um, for success. So I think those guys are awesome. Um, creative live is great for, for photography and videography. Is that the Chase Jarvis thing, the creative yeah. live? Yeah. 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 Chase is awesome. And I feel like Chase Jarvis is my Casey Nice that like I've been following Chase mm -hmm. like back when he was just like a lifestyle photographer and he's just, He's gone crazy in terms of like building a company for for creatives. Nice. So I kind of, I want to pivot a little bit, but it's also related to what you're just saying about like building relationships with the mm -hmm. people you want to be sitting next to. So how do you think we in the community can be more inclusive as a community? Like how can we start getting more people involved in stuff like this, getting them out to NAB, getting them out to half res, getting people to really come out from behind the curtains? Because I know where I am in Baltimore there's like a handful of motion designers that I probably don't even know that are just like in these agencies that probably have a voice and opinion about things, but we just don't hear from them. So what do you think is the best next steps that we can do to get people in with us? <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad you asked because I feel like that was the best thing about the, it was buried away about two hours into our three hour podcast, but um, mm -hmm. all you have to do, I just did it while you were talking. I just hit the right button over and over and um I'm sad to say that there's a lot of people that look just like me and the only variation is you guys have hair and I don't. Um, but there's a lot of white dudes with beards and glasses. And I said this before, um, it's really frustrating when I have my creative director um, meetings every week here across the three offices that again, if you just had four boxes and you could just multiply me in each one of those boxes, we all look the same. We have those same life experiences. We're about the same age. Um, I would say our range of things that we are inspired by and that we reference um, are probably all very similar. You know, we, we all probably watch the same animation. We probably all know the same artists um, within a small range of deviation. Um, I think it's our responsibility to change that um, in the industry, partially because if you think about the work we do, we are doing the work that, that sells product or creates the, the climate of cool or creates what's socially acceptable to anybody who's watching TV, anybody who picks up a phone, anybody who kind of does anything um, that interacts socially, it's our responsibility to lift more people up. So part of it is, you know, like doing something that may not feel necessarily comfortable, reaching down to people that are younger than you and asking them to be treated like a peer. Um, if you are in the room with three or four people and you notice that the one woman in the room never speaks up, finding time and find an environment where she can speak up. And that takes work sometimes. Sometimes it takes talking to someone privately and having a difficult conversation and saying like, hey, I don't understand why you're not you're speaking up. Is there anything I can do? It may take three or four conversations. It may take going out to lunch. It may take bringing the rest of the team out somewhere that's not in the office and explaining like, wow, this person has amazing ideas. And I feel like as a group, we're not taking advantage of that and we're not creating an environment. Um, it's hard um, because I think a lot of us don't think we're doing anything to kind of create a situation that is where we're at right now, right? But it, it's something where there's so many other people, there's so many other voices, there's so many other life experiences. I know this because teaching at MoGraph Mentor, I would teach six people and it was amazing and the conversation and the references and how fast we learned about different things um, was cool because I would literally have one person that would be in Lebanon, one person that would be in Southeast Asia, 
somewhere, whether it was Vietnam or it'd be someone in Japan or someone in Australia, every one of my classes would have five or six people and it'd be probably half men, half women, but I'd have someone from South Africa talking to someone from Ireland, talking to someone from LA. And when we would go and do pitches of like, hey, here's your idea, what are you gonna do? Everybody would have totally different references. And it was so eye-opening to me to be like, oh my God, if I had these six people and I had to pitch Starbucks, I would have such a better shot at winning the job because the six people are coming from completely different places and having completely different references and completely different ideas that it just, it, it got me excited and it got me really angry whenever I would go back to work because we would again go back to work and whether it was men or whether it was people from America or all people from the same socioeconomic background, everybody was kind of basically pitching the same thing. It's like, just what flavor of robot are you pitching versus the other person next to you? Like the difference is, like I said, the, the range of deviation and the things that you're excited about needs to be wider when you work for, for our clients and you work for doing something where you're selling a product to someone. So I don't know if that answers it. We could talk about that forever. And it's honestly a problem that no one has really solved. Um, but yeah, I think first off, um, the easiest thing I think you can do is when you retweet stuff or when you find stuff that you think is interesting, find some things that are slightly different that aren't just retweeting the same 20 or 30 people that everybody's already else has retweeted. You can go out and find work. You can go out and find things on Behance. Like when I feel like when the internet, when I first started spending time on the internet, the thing that was super cool was everybody was trying to find something that no one else had seen before. Right now, now I feel like everybody lives in the same three or four echo chambers. We're all in the same slacks. We're all in the same Twitter, like groups of people on Twitter. We're all looking at motionographer. Um, and we just basically echo back and forth like, wow, wasn't that really cool? And then somebody else says, yeah, that was really cool. We don't even talk about what it was that made it cool. We're just like, oh, I wish I could do that. But I, I feel like there's so much more to be said. You know, like I, one of the things that I love is um, in comic books, there's a lot of, it's actually, actually pretty controversial, but there's a big focus on trying to find diversity. There's a big push in trying to find different voices. And in comic books, it's really it's really awesome because whatever your work is, it's so personal, right? Like if you're a penciler, or if you're an inker, or if you're writing your own book, it's so from who you are. Um, but there's a lot of movements within comic books for diversity in comics, and there'll be some type of like tweet storm that comes out where someone's like, I wanna see every, every book from every person, every woman that's working in South African comic books, find somebody and post it. And then for two days, you'll just be introduced to all these people if you follow a hashtag. Um, it seems like that's an easy way or an easy thing we could be doing because the, the one thing I've noticed is uh, I just started a podcast, not out yet, but I started, I'm done recording. I'm in the middle of editing. One thing I've realized that maybe I should have realized earlier is that I asked, I think I asked six women and six men and all the men said yes immediately. Only one of the women said yes. Five other ones said, no, I can't. And didn't really give me reasons why. I thought it was really curious. And then the one woman who I did get to say yes two days before apologized and said no, that she couldn't. And it really was eye-opening to me because I don't think we realize how difficult it is for especially minorities and women to make the choice to try to publicize themselves, try to start branding themselves. Because the experience as a white dude versus anyone else online or in areas where people can be anonymous is a totally different life experience. Mm -hmm. um, and I had some heart to heart conversations with a couple of the women that I really, really want to do an interview with because I really felt like their point of views would have helped the people who potentially might listen to this podcast. Um, learning about the, the things that happen online, learning about the things that happen at the office that they work at. Um, one was heartbreaking, but two was mind blowing. Um, so I don't know. I feel like the easiest thing to do is just, you know, if you find something cool, Think about who it is. And if you're not finding anything cool, go out and look for stuff from people or places that might be different and, you know, try to, try to raise some other people up. Yeah. Like as I was reaching out to you to come on here, I would reach out to like Caitlin Cashew and Dorka, who was on the motion hatch podcast with you and a couple other yep. people. And it seemed like outside of like Dorka and Caitlin who have done this before, the other ones mm -hmm. I've reached out to were like, like very hesitant about coming on or even like responding or, or like getting into the discussion of it. Like, oh, well, thank you so much. And then just like kind of moved on from the conversation. And it's like, yeah. really wanna, like no matter who you are, come hang out with us and talk with us, come to a Monday meeting. And seriously, it's always just this chill, like people talking in chat, asking questions back and forth. Uh, yeah. and I, I'd love to see more of that. And, um, just right. how, like, how can we build that up? Well, I, and it's what I said before. And, you know, like, I know we had a, di a dis dis we had different opinions, David Broder and I, but I, I really think 
that you can only say so many times, lift someone up by their bootstraps or, you know, stand up for yourselves without realizing that there needs to be a safe space and a safe environment for people to do that. Like Caitlin and I had some serious conversations um, early on about, you know, interactions with, with something like Slack or interactions with Twitter. Um, and until I really realized, thankfully, from someone like Caitlin, that it's going to take two or three times. Like, I feel like I saw in here, um, Shabella said, like, if I was more confident in interviews, my voice or video, I probably would. That's all of us, right? Like, I felt the same way, but it was a lot easier for me because I'm looking at a room of peers, right? Like, I'm not worried that anybody's going to look at me and be like, oh, man, you sound stupid. Or what are you wearing? Or, you know, like, you don't look right. But because of someone else's different life experience, that that's being slammed in you at work and in just social environments and school and relationships. Um, it took a long time for me to really realize that we need to create a space for women. You know what I think would be amazing for a Monday meeting is for you guys to find someone that can run one of these that actually is a, wom a woman or is a minority and then have a room where it's just women talking to each other like this. Like if you guys came out and said, we're going to do a Monday meeting, a special one, it's going to be for women only because we want to create an environment where you guys can feel comfortable doing this. And from this, we want to interview five of the 20 people that show up. That would be something that would be amazing. Yeah, you know, that's like, a great like, idea. Let people have a place where they can get used to speaking, get used to talking, figure out what they're doing. Like, like I, I will say that my dying day applaud Paul Babb for a million different things, right? But what he did at, at Maxon's booth and what he did at, I think it was at Seagraphic, or NAB this year, and actually had, I think it was four, five, or six women and did a press conference about women in motion graphics and basically provided a forum and then took two steps back and just said, go, go out to the world, go talk about what you want to talk about. But this is a way for this to change. Um, that, I mean, that, I feel like every group that has an audience, every group that has a community, if they really want to make a change, that's a great example on how to do it. Yeah. And I, oh, my camera just shut off again. But uh, what I wanted to say to everyone who is in this meeting today is that we try to create like a safe space for everyone. Like anyone who wants to join, like come on in, like talk about whatever you want to talk about. We record these, but we don't post them all per se. Uh, if, if there's things that come up and people are not comfortable with sharing it, that's great and we like want to keep this like a safe space to be able to open up and, and share either client stories or business stories or whatever it may be so uh i think what ryan mentioned about doing like a a, a possible like women's only one or whatnot i think that's a great idea um and i think we should definitely look into that and, and make that happen for sure um, mm -hmm. but every, every week I encourage everyone to come and, and participate in this and, and feel comfortable, uh, participating, knowing that most of these are kept private and, uh, mm -hmm. and that we just want, really want to like foster this community. So, yeah, yeah. I think it's important to do something like that, which I, I think in some ways is kind of, um, a passively aware kind of situation, but then I think it's also actively lifting people up, right? Like actively promoting people, actively saying like, this person is good as everyone else. Like when you give off a list of people you'd want to work with, having two or three women that's in that list, right? Like having, when you think of people that are female designers that you think should be promoted, um, I just feel like there, there's a passive way to do it. Like, okay, cool, we should always find a way but I also think it's important not just to do like, oh, here's a women's only event just for women. I think it's also important at the same time to have a way to say like, on this list right here, there should also be three women on stage at a conference, right? Like there's so many times where, like if you knew the amount of designers that actually drive the industry at the shops you love that are women that just don't care about going out and making their name, it would blow you away. It just in general, the amount of people, like we think we know the industry because all of us are here and we watch online and we see Twitter and we see Slack we see motionographer, but men, women, female, minorities, whatever it might be, there are so many other people in the industry that just don't care about promoting themselves that actually drive the industry. Um, you'd be blown away. Like every shop has four or five people that are better than all the people you know the names of, um, but they just don't care. They just go to work, they make their work, they go home and they have really full lives. Um, so I think understanding that, like I, personally, I'm tired of going to conventions. I'm tired of going to speaking engagements where it's all dudes. Um, where it's all men and it's not even men, it's the same people over and over. Um, I think there's something to be said about that. I know there's a couple of people online have kind of made the moments or the movement to say like, 
you know, if you're asked to speak at something, one of the first questions you should ask is what's the lineup? And if it's the same five or six people that you always see, it's probably a time to go and probably a time not to go. And that might be a time not to go and offer up your spot to someone else. Yeah. Um, I also, now that we've kind of like doubled how many participants are in here too, if, if you weren't here in the beginning and we kind of wrap up after an hour, if you have any last minute questions you want to get in to Ryan, I don't know, your, your time is probably running up to Ryan as you need to start your work day. Yeah, but. I can go, for, I can go for, I mean, if there's more questions, I can go for a few minutes. I mean, I feel like okay. I've been ranting on the same couple things for a while. <laughs> No, uh, yeah. I just want to make sure that people that joined in late, because now we're at like almost 60 people in here when we started, it was on 25 or 30. So uh, yeah, if you let's, let's, do, let's do a lightning round. Do we have a lightning yeah. round? Do, I mean, I'll, I'll scroll back up to you and see if there's any questions. Yeah. I, mean, I hope uh, that was useful. I hope it wasn't just me standing on a soapbox. I, I hate no, 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 no. I think all of it's useful, and, and there's been good comments coming in from the chat. So. Okay, cool. Yeah. Let's see. Well, I, and honestly, the other thing I think, I, while we're looking for other questions, the one thing I would say is, um, we're all learning. You know, I think most people have the best of intentions, but there's some people who are afraid of saying something. There's some people who are afraid of saying the wrong thing. Um, someone mentioned in the future to the women in design live stream. Um, super awkward and kind of weird at times, but that's a step forward. The fact that somebody who has a platform was trying to, to do something, I think that's the right first step. Um, but I don't think there's ever a time to kind of like relax or, or just like, oh, cool, we did it once, now everything is equal. Um, I feel like it's something that's going to be consistent and constant. Um, I'm looking up. Yeah, any other questions? I see one from Gumbo Inc. It says, yep. advice on pitching and commu communicating with clients going from an art director to a creative director. That's a great question because I, I, honestly, that's where I draw the line between an art director and a creative director is the art director can run a team, can, can work internally and deal with feedback. Um, but to me, a creative director is someone who, who is client facing. Um, I would say on the pitching side, um, try to avoid recycling other people's ideas. <laughs> um, it's an epidemic in the industry right now. Um, because of the pressure, there's no pitch fees a lot of times or there's very short amount of turnaround time. Um, I see a lot of people just taking reference and selling that as ideas. Um, that has a whole heap of different problems that could happen going from, you know, you just looking like everyone else's work to you pitching against somebody who you actually pitch their work against them to maybe you actually win off of someone else's idea and then you have to go and actually find a way to make that without getting sued into oblivion. I've had personal experience that if you ever meet me in person, I can tell you the story that almost shut a very famous shop down um, that I'm not gonna broadcast to 60 people, but uh, anywhere we're at, I'll tell you the story. Um, but yeah, I think um, understand that there's a difference between homage and reference and straight up swipe. Um, I think it's why I always talk about voice and vision. Like if you have, if you have a sketchbook or you have a, a, a lightning catalog of ideas that you're always trying to execute on or you're writing or you have a Pinterest board that like, man, if I could find a way to take this black on black photography from this photographer mixed in with Mike Mignola's style that he does cowboy mixed with what Edgar Wright does when he cuts three shots together. Plus, I've always wanted to do something that deals with magic versus science personally. Right. And you're chasing that and you're looking for the job to fit those into that, I think, is the biggest difference to safeguard yourself is that you have a personal voice, you have a personal vision, you have things inside of yourself like, man, I gotta find a job that I can try, to try this idea out in. And that's, I think, the difference between an art director who's just handed a bunch of things and has to execute it versus a creative director who's got an idea or a, a story or a vision that he's looking or she is looking to execute throughout their career. And they're always, like, I honestly think that that's why Patrick Clare is who Patrick Clare is, right? We all kind of laugh now that there's a Patrick Clare look. That dude has spent 10 years trying to figure out what that was and then another five years perfecting it. And now he's the only guy who ever gets to do title sequences because he had a voice and a vision that got so popular that it's now become a style. But you know, that, to me, that's almost like an end goal. Is like, if you can become ubiquitous because you've spent a decade and a half developing your own personal vision, it's like in comic books, right? Like there are artists who at different times in, career, in the like lifespan of comics, their style gets copied by so many people like Jack Kirby or Jim Lee that like, like Everybody tried to draw like that person. They all looked like copies, like really bad photocopies of them, but that person spent a decade. Mike Mignola's style is so amazing that no one can actually even do it. Anybody who tries to do it, it looks like a joke and everybody you know, kind of calls them out. Um, that's where you, I feel like if you really want to be a creative director, that should be kind of your goal, is to develop a personal vision, a personal style that everybody wants to emulate, but nobody really can. 
Um, I've got another one that came in earlier from Taylor Cox, who's at work. Uh, he wants to know what's a trend that you see that is dying and a trend that you will grow or that will grow in the coming year. Um, so yeah, you've, you've kind of hit on that with Twitter a couple of times, but what, what do you think is going to be coming up in the next year for 2019? Um, I think 2019 and 2020 are going to be the year of remote freelance. Um, I think those are going to be the years where the tool of armature and the rest of the industry catches up to what we all here already know is that you don't have to have a room in an expensive city full of expensive, you know, $800,000, $900,000 day artists to compete with anyone. And I think we already know that. I think we're already seeing it. But I think that that's when all the studios that we love will really start to understand that and will be forced to embrace it or will be forced to kind of fall into the distance. Um, the amount of talent that's out there that works in a lot of different places that can take advantage of like the geographic advantage of being in Nashville or being in South America or being in a cheaper to live place where they can have a good quality of life, a good work life balance, can raise a family, but still do competitive work. When you have things like Pixel Plot, when you have things like Slack and you have things like Friend.io and things like Zoom, there's no reason that you have to just take the best of the talent that's available to you in a very expensive city to start a studio or to compete with a pre-existing studio. So I think that that's gonna be increasingly more and more something that studios like us that have been around for 20 years are gonna to have to accept and get better. Um, and I think that our competition is already here and is, is already kicking our ass in some ways with two or three people working across the country or working across the world um, at any time. And I think it's an actually exciting time because the opposite is what happened in visual effects where all the work just got outsourced to every country that's cheaper and then it kind of didn't really, it has become a commodity. Um, I feel like that's one way that our industry is going to avoid just having a, a menu of, okay, I want a character here and I want a transition here and it's going to only cost $250. You know, like it's not going to be a menu of items that you can just, you know, take at the lowest price. Yeah. Um, how about, let's see, from Tokyo Megaplex, are there projects that you haven't worked on yet in your career that you'd like to be working on? So like interactive games, tour visuals, et cetera. That's, that's everything. Everything I've ever <laughs> wanted to do, I haven't done yet. Um, I really desperately want to get back into character animation. That's one of the goals I've had since I came to DK, and it's, it hasn't happened yet, but hopefully we get our feet underneath us with that. Um, I think there's an incredible um, set of animators here in Chicago um, that I think if I could find the right jobs to kind of glue them all together for three or four months together at the same time. Um, I love the fact that cell animation is finding a resurgence in motion graphics. I abhor the fact that there's like two house styles across all motion graphics and cell animation. And I think that there's, it's one of the purest art forms. And I'm really frustrated that there's essentially two or three ways to do it. Um, like long limbed, flat characters with black outlines and black triangle drop shadows have just gotten to the point where I'm, I'm just so tired of seeing it. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, and then rubber hose. Um, again, that's one of those things I said earlier where technology commodifies codified style, like people's styles are being determined by the technology, whether it's 3D with, um, with you know, Octane and Redshift just being done at the base level, what it gives you versus really exploring what's possible, or 2D animation, people learning from the same three tutorials or using the same two or three um, scripts. Um, it, it's super frustrating to me. It's the same thing that happened in video games. Like right at the point where video games have the capability to make essentially fully immersive animation quality, like feature animation quality games, um, they, everything went to photorealism and we've never seen it kind of really turned back. We've seen a, a kind of small explosion of like indie developed video games that I think are getting back to, you know, more artistic styles, like games like Journey and, game, you know, there's a ton of mobile games and smaller games on PC. But I feel like the whole industry went towards this just like murder simulators and just photorealistic kind of boring games. Um, I, I, I'm afraid that, you know, motion graphics can get that way with it's either going to go towards the super photo, photorealistic, like a TV commercial from a VFX house, or there's going to be these two animation styles and everybody's just going to do them um, over and over and over until people get sick of it. So that's why I say there's always room. If you have a vision or you have a style that's different or you're exploring something, um, there's always room for something new, especially in motion graphics. Yeah. Um, let's see. I have a question that I didn't ask early on. Who do you want to hear from in the industry? And you kind of touched on the, that you're starting a podcast. So like what kind of stories do you think are currently missing from the industry? Um, so I'll just do, I ha, I'm probably still like a month or two away, which will probably turn into the beginning of the next year for the podcast, to be honest. I'm trying to, I'm trying to do it all by myself right now. Um, Cause I feel like it's important to just have like, again, a, a voice that's focused. But um, for my, my podcast, the real idea for it was, 
we all again live in our kind of echo chamber, but we're never really hearing from people in like our brother and sister industries or, or, or kind of parts of the industry. Um, I'm tired of hearing from the same seven or eight people. That's myself included. I don't know if people really need to hear from me all that much more, but I think they, it might be great to hear from people that I know that aren't in motion graphics. So um, the show is basically, the first season of the show is basically about failing as an artist and how to um, keep going. You know, like when you have a job you love and you fuck it up, how do you wake up the next day and, and move forward? So um, I'm talking to people like Stu Mashwitz. I'm talking to people like the guy who directed Maze Runner, um, who almost killed his lead actor. I'm talking to people who edited the Hunger Games films and then went to the Spider-Man movies that no one liked. Um, how do you work for 18 months to two years on, on a project that you put everything into and the day it comes out, people say it's one of the worst movies ever or it's one of the, the worst incarnations of a character. Um, people like uh, a friend of mine who's been in LA for 12 years, sold his first script and has never worked on another project since then and has chased breaking, re-breaking into the industry for 12 years. Um, how do you keep doing that? Um, talking to younger artists who have never been an art director, who've just been hired to become an art director, you know, three weeks before I interviewed them. Um, so the general idea is something like that, like talking to people in related industries where you have an artistic career and you're trying to be a creative professional that might necessarily be the same echo chamber of people you're used to hearing from. Um, but at least this first season is talking about the hardest thing to talk about, uh, talking about when you screwed up and how you recover and how you keep going. Um, if people dig it, the, the general idea is I interviewed 12 people. Um, and I'm cutting all the people's interviews as if it was one long conversation with everyone in the room. So it's taking a little bit longer than a normal just interview and post. Um, but essentially, I asked 12 people the same 12 questions. And curiously enough, they, a lot of people had very different reactions. So it's almost as if they were talking to each other rather than just me talking you know, all the time. Um, but the idea is to release, hopefully it would be five, six, or eight episodes based on the way I cut it. Um, they'll hopefully be 30 to 40 minutes. They won't be super long, so you can listen to them. Um, pretty quickly on a, on a kind of um, kind of commute. Um, and then that goal is at the end of it that I'll release all 12 in interviews individually, um, you know, week by week, so that you can hear the whole take, um, pretty much unedited, so the opposite of what you've heard the few ones before that. Um, and then the goal is to record the second season while I'm releasing those 12 kind of episodes week by week, so that if people dig it, there'll be a new theme for the next season, new guests, um, and then just kind of rinse and repeat. Most people like it. If not, there'll be one season and it'll be like a good TV show that lasts the season long. Sweet. Nice. Uh, yeah, how about you, Mark? Have you seen any questions or anything? I, that I missed? No, but I just have a couple lightning round questions I thought maybe could be fun. Uh, okay. Favorite comic book? Hellboy, no question. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll actually say there's two that are always for the rest of my life will be tied Hellboy and Bone. Favorite movie? Iron Giant, best movie of all time. Favorite documentary? Oh, that's tough because there's so many more now. Um, I would say <laughs> there's a new there's a new movie um, with I always forget his name, but the guy who was the lead of The Office called Marwin. But there's a documentary about the guy who Marwin is based on called Welcome to Marwin Call. It's one of only three movies I've ever given a ten out of ten. Hmm. All right, I'll have to check that one out. I haven't seen it. Favorite director? I'm, I'm gonna field some out of the chat too. Um, favorite director, I would say up until Tomorrowland, it would have been Brad Bird, um, but it'd be Guillermo del Toro. Oh, nice. Uh, favorite plugin? Uh, favorite plugin, X Particles. Favorite lens? Uh, I have a Sigma 18 to 35 F1.8 that I never take off my camera. <laughs> nice. Favorite podcast host? <laughs> favorite podcast host? Um, my buddy or podcast too. Um, there's a there's a podcast about screenwriting called um, Hiller Guest Screenwriters Rant Room. It's the best podcast. I listen a lot about writing just because I think the process is really an analog to what it is like to be a creative director without literally being the same thing. But there's a lot of lessons to be learned. Um, there's this guy named Hiller Guest Screenwriters Rant Room. My buddy Chris Derrick, who is the guy I talked about, um, that was a filmmaker and writer who sold his first script, got to Hollywood and is still chasing like his next job 12 years later. He is the most knowledgeable person on film I've ever met. And he's just a joy to listen to. Nice. Favorite creative conference? Um, it will be, um, oh, what is the one in Vancouver that I'm totally forgetting the name, but that would do every two years. Blend. Blend Fest. I've, I've bought tickets to Blend every time and I have not been able to go. 
Um, but Blend will be my favorite conference. Um, I just have to get there. Lucky D says, favorite non-motion graphics software you can't live without? Um, other than the Twitter client, which doesn't really count as creative software, um, I would say Scrivener. Scrivener. Okay, cool. And if you're drawing uh, pen and paper or iPad Pro and Apple Pencil? Um, start off pen and paper, scan it to iPad Pro, print it back out, and ink it on paper. And what... What app do you uh, use on the iPad? Procreate, no doubt. And the yep. new, new version is going to be even better. Nice. Uh, and best way to promote your work? Um, create fans by talking to them face-to-face -face and have people that will be your, your best fans. Cool. And last one, this is kind of a joke, but RTX on or off? <laughs> off, for now. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, I think that, I, I mean, ton of great info today and everything yeah. packed in, uh, I mean, just, just over an hour. So thank you so much for coming on, Ryan. Really yeah, appreciate guys, it. This is, this is amazing. I can't believe we had, do we have 60 people? Do we actually? Do we... I think we broke the record today. Yes. Uh, I think we had like 57 cool. was, was the peak. So ju just awesome. under 60. Nice. Very cool. Yeah. Awesome. Well, um, one thing I'll ask if, um, if anybody wants to do this, but just do it one-on-one, -on -one, um, I think you guys have the link or you can put it in the notes. Um, mm -hmm. I'll just type it in too here. Um, if you ever want to just talk one-on-one -on -one for 15 minutes um, or 30 minutes to do like a real review, or if you're ever in Chicago and you want to go out to lunch, I have a, um, a, I think I just posted it. Yeah. I have a calendar app that you can just literally like reserve my lunch hour um, to sit down and talk. If you want to look at a demo reel or get some more advice or um, any of it, uh, just block it out. Um, I'll, I think I might have done it privately to Andy instead of actually putting it up to everybody. We're going to hang in the chat. Um, but um, I'll, I'll apologize in, in advance that sometimes I have to reschedule because my, my calendar gets kind of crazy sometimes for work. Um, but yeah, just reach out there, um, book a time, we'll talk, we'll meet. Cool. And in terms of other social presence, you're pretty much odd or not everywhere, right? Yep, exactly. Right on. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Ryan. We really appreciate it. Liam, is there any last minute items you want to mention? No, I think that's it. Thanks for joining us. Of course, as Mark's already said, uh, for people that are new to this, since we hit like almost 60 people, you can find us every week here, Monday at 10 a.m. Eastern time, just kind of hang out and do this. And then once a month, we're trying to have a special guest on like Ryan. Um, and then we've had like Barton Damer in the past and a couple other people, Haley Akins was just on a couple weeks ago and we'll kind of just do like a presentation like this and hang out and talk with people, ask questions. Um, but yeah, if you ever just want to hang out on Mondays, everyone that's joined us this week, come hang out. Everyone's welcome. We try and level the playing field. If there's somebody in here like David Aryev or Ryan, just come in and you can talk to them and they are the same people that you know in your real life. Like we, we're all human beings. So feel free to talk to them. Um, also, yeah, Monday yeah, Thanks, Billy. Really. <laughs> yeah, I forgot about the website. Awesome. So, yeah, I think that's it for me. Cool. Well, thanks awesome. again, everyone, for joining. Uh, Ryan, do you have any last words, parting words? No, just uh, thanks, everybody. And, man, like, like the more you guys can do this with other people, Twitter is, is awesome, but it falls apart fast. Just do more of this. Do FaceTime, do Hangouts, just talk to each other instead of talking at each other. Awesome. Love that. That's a great part, uh, piece of advice. So. Um, thank right, you guys, guys, everybody, for joining, and we'll see you next week. Yeah, have a great week, everybody. Yep. See Bye. ya. Brograph.com, an online resource for learning Cinema 4D, After Effects, and other motion graphics tools specifically catered to help you prevail as a motion graphic designer. What's up, bros? Welcome to another Brograph motion graphics tutorial. With tutorials, plugins, and now a podcast with tens of thousands of listeners worldwide. Yeah, it's a great community to be part of. We give you professional time-saving tips, industry news, interviews, shortcuts, and lessons that help keep you current in the world of motion design. Throw in an HDR studio, take the render settings, pick the HDR, put a reflection, and gorgeous. I love projects that scare me. When our art director comes to us and asks for something that I had never done before, man, it gets me pumped. 
Our weekly long-form podcast will give you the latest news, help you in your file management, hardware configuration, and client relations. Learn about the latest render engines, modeling techniques, and workflow integration while staying entertained. Real nice banana. Ah, that's so funny. All right. I'm going to live forever. <laughs> Our BroGraph talks are a chance to see the way industry leaders from around the globe are changing the face of motion design. Sometimes you got to make stuff that you're not going to put on your reel. And I'm not here to judge. The podcast and talks include people like People, Barton Damer, Nick Campbell, Andrew Kramer, David Ariev, Chad Ashley, Paul Babb, EJ Hasenfrost, Mitch Myers, Chris Schmidt, Jules Urbach, Cornelius Dammer, David Brodeur, Andy Needham, Caitlin Kaju, Zubair Parker, Noseman, Ryan Bean, Casey Hupke, Nick Lyons, Sage, Joey Corinman, Jeremy Cox, Rick Barrett, John Dickinson, Matthias Omatola, Patrick Gosky, Brandon Clements, Steve Teeple, Tom Glimpse, Patrick Lundstrom, Julia Simone, Devin Coe, Al Heck, and even Dead Mouse. You get that render done. Yeah, you better frame frame what? Our BroGraph breakdowns go behind the projects and give you an insight on what it's like to manage and maintain your own personal business or work for a large company. Join us for live sessions, check out our useful plugins, watch time-lapse projects, interact with us, and send us email questions and topic ideas. Or just hit the rando render button and do an imaginative daily that'll keep you on your toes. Take all your dreams and let's do it! Subscribe today and get automatic updates on the latest tutorials, tricks, tips, and inspiration brought to you by industry professionals Dave Koss and Matt Milstead. We don't care how you get here, folks. Just get here. Subscribe now to BroGraph Tutorials. Pretty good, I guess.